Da Vinci's journal. Entry one. That's it. Done. Leah and I are retired. No more contracts. No more blades in the dark. And no more sneaking about. Leah says I'll soon grow tired of a normal life, but I'm not sure. I think I've seen all the death I care to. Now it's time to settle down and spend some of the gold we've saved. So meet the new us, just an honest couple doing honest work. Entry 2. We've just bought a house in Riverhold. Life is good here. It's peaceful enough and quite pretty in its own way. Most of the locals are pleasant and far more accepting than we were expecting. It's a very cosmopolitan place with all the border trading that goes on. No one seems to mind the idea of an Argonian and a Khajiit living together. Our new home is next door to the town orphanage, and Leah keeps bringing it up in conversation. She wants a family. I'll be honest, the idea terrifies me. Is it possible that a couple of trained assassins like us could be good parents? I don't know. Entry 3. I'm working a local mine, and Leah just got a job at the orphanage. We went there yesterday. I think I'm going to be a father. We saw two little Khajiit boys that melted our hearts. They are supposedly twins, but one is golden, and the other is an unusual shade of blue. Seeing Leah with the boys, I don't know. It just felt right. We discussed adopting them all night. She said that if it was only down to her, she'd go and collect them now. I told Leah I had to think about it, but I'm fairly sure my mind is made up. She is going to be an amazing mother. I love her more than words can say and can deny her nothing. I lock all our weapons in the basement and get to work on making the spare room baby-proof. Entry 4 We are now proud parents. We've named the boys Fergus and Inigo, after our favorite former guildmates. The woman at the orphanage told us the little she knew of their past. A soldier found Inigo and Fergus in an abandoned shack about 50 miles from here. He heard them crying as he took shelter, and discovered the boys wrapped in linen rags, half hidden in a pile of straw. The boys had a letter tucked between them. It was from their birth mother. We were shown the letter but it was ragged and torn, so I asked if I could make a copy for posterity. It reads, Atala hopes you have found her children safe. They are twins, born only minutes apart, though as you can see, they are unalike. What had been a pleasant day began to darken at the time of their birth, and I heard much wailing and commotion outside my tent. My first son came then, but by the time his little brother entered the world, the sky outside was like night. I held them in my arms, and it was as if their cries brought back the sun, for then the darkness lifted and the voices outside rejoiced. I smiled and wondered if a third moon had appeared during my labor, as such a thing is said to signal the arrival of a main. Wishful Atala, stupid Atala, cursed Atala, there had been no third moon, only darkness. A few weeks later, my youngest sprouted his first blue hair, and his fate was decided. It has been nearly two hundred years since the last bad moon omen, but upon seeing that tiny blue strand, our elder recognized its meaning. The village would suffer greatly unless my baby was put to death. Alas, Atala could not allow it. I can no longer trust the father of my children, the moons hold greater sway over his heart than we do. Our situation fills him with great sadness, but he is elder-born and wishes to appease Masser and Secunda above all else. The night before the sacrifice, I heard a woman's voice speak, though no woman could be seen. The voice was fair, but commanding. It said, Run, Atala! The way is clear! Take your babies and flee! I bundled up my little ones and snuck away into the desert. I have traveled many miles, but my people are tracking us, and they grow close. They will have blood one way or another. I would rather it were mine. Earlier the woman's voice spoke up again inside my head. She said I must go now, and draw our pursuers away from this place. She said my children will be found here by one who can help them. As strange as it sounds, I believe her. 
Please, take my darlings to safety, and when they are old enough to understand, tell them that Atala loves them still. Leah says that she has never heard of such a barbarically pious tribe in her homeland, but the existence of such people does not surprise her. There are stories of forgotten settlements that still thrive in isolation among the shifting sands. Atala must have hailed from such a place. Her plan worked, and now her boys are safe and loved. Leah and I will do our utmost to give them the best of everything. When they are old enough, we will tell the boys about their mother and what she endured to save their lives. It is a sad tale, and I am not sure if we will ever tell them absolutely everything. That is a worry for another day. Here and now, they are happy, and they make us happy. Long may it last. Entry 5 Leah and I are just back from a job. I know, I know. We're retired, but it was good to flex these old muscles again, and it was only a group of outlaws. The thugs had been terrorizing a village a few miles away, so we waited until dark, left the boys at the orphanage with one of Leah's co-workers, tooled up, and took care of business. By the hist, it felt good. I must admit my armor is getting a little snug, but it seems Leah and I are as good a team as ever. I love her so much. When we returned to the orphanage, Leah's friend led us to the basement, where Inigo and Fergus were chasing spiders. They looked so adorable, I had to draw them. Entry 6. We have decided to teach the boys how to handle themselves. I'm sure many would say they are too young for weapons, but it's a harsh world out there, and we both agree they'll be better off with a little training. Inigo instantly took a shine to archery, while Fergus seems to favor the sword. They both show great aptitude even at such a young age. I am a very proud father. Fergus is already turning into a determined and thoughtful boy. Inigo has amazing reflexes and a sense of the absurd that often has the rest of us laughing even when we shouldn't be. Most importantly, the brothers are fiercely loyal. They often fight and squabble, but at the slightest hint of danger, they unflinchingly stand up for one another. When I'm down the mines, the boys spend most of their days at the orphanage with Leah. It's sad, but you could say they never really left. Ah oh well, I see no harm and they often cheer up the other children. Entry 7. Poor Inigo had a bit of trouble at the market today. Some local boys and girls were making fun of him because of his blue fur. Little hooligans. If he'd had his bow with him, I think he would have taught them a thing or two. If Fergus had been there, things could have gotten ugly. We don't want either of the boys seriously hurting anyone, so Leah showed them a few hand-to-hand -hand tricks, just in case things get rough. We adults often forget what a battleground childhood can be. I spoke to the parents of the boy who instigated the bullying. The father said his son wasn't responsible and called me a filthy lizard. Maybe this town isn't as open-minded as we first thought. Entry 8. Leah discovered Fergus and Inigo playing with our most precious weapons today. I have no idea how they got the display cases open. Luckily, Inigo is still too weak to draw lightning and thunder is too heavy for them to wield. Can you imagine if either had discharged in the house? We locked the weapons away in a safer place. We have to keep an eye on those boys. Entry 9. Sadness and excitement today. Riverhold lost three people to a large group of migrating giant spiders. Leah and I knew we were the only ones capable of helping, so we strapped on our weapons and exterminated the beasts. To be honest, the boys did most of the work. They were eager to test their weapons on live targets, and I must say, they did fantastically well. As the villagers hid in their homes, Leah and I dispatched about ten of the beasts, then watched as Inigo and Fergus took care of the rest. They fought efficiently and with great zeal. Fergus became a quiet whirlwind of deadly steel as Inigo expertly loosed a storm of arrows and insults. That boy would joke on the gallows. They are young men now, and they are already talking about leaving Riverhold to seek their fortune. I would rather my children sought a more sedentary occupation, but they clearly wish to use their skill to help others who are less able. I'm confident that as long as they have each other, they will be safe. Entry 10. 
Our little boys are now men. It feels like only yesterday they were just fuzzy little bundles. Leah and I have agreed to let them travel the land in search of their fortune. They leave behind two extremely proud parents. We are gifting them our most prized weapons. Inigo will take lightning, Leah's bow. Fergus will take thunder, my sword. May they protect our children and strike fear into the hearts of all who oppose them. I better stop writing and help them pack. Dearest Fergus and Inigo, come back safe and happy. I miss you already. Entry 11. They're gone. Our boys, our sons, our greatest achievement. Leah and I are already growing restless, rattling around this empty house. Everything is the same, but everything has changed. They will return in a few years, and I cannot wait to see the men they will surely have become. Until that day, we'll keep the fire stoked and their rooms ready. Entry 12. A courier brought us news from the boys today. It's been over a year since they last sent word. They are well and happy. They say they have had many adventures and are now heading to Cyrodiil. They have caught the traveling bug and want to see as much of Tamriel as they can before coming home. I'm so glad they are all right. The letter has put us in a fantastic mood. Leah and I went to the inn and had a few drinks. We spent most of the night toasting our boys repeatedly. They are happy, they are safe, and they are together. All is well. Entry 13. We haven't heard from Inigo and Fergus in a long time, but I'm sure they are okay. There is a lot of world out there to explore. Let them have their fill of it before returning. They are not the only ones who feel the call of the road. Leah and I are growing tired of our inactive lifestyle. Perhaps we can go on a little trip of our own. Something with a better risk and adventure. It has been far too long. Entry 14. Adventure has found us. I can't wait to hit the road again. A trading caravan passed through town today and they were looking for guards. It's perfect. A bit of travel, a bit of adventure, and who knows, we may even bump into Fergus and Inigo. We join the group tomorrow. Leah is choosing her armor at the moment. I think we should each take a light and heavy set. It sounds like we could be passing through bandit territory. Nothing we can't handle, I'm sure. Leah is calling me. I had better get my things together. No one seems to mind the idea of an Argonian and a Khajiit living together. Our new home is next door to the town orphanage, and Leah keeps bringing it up in conversation. She wants a family. I'll be honest, the idea terrifies me. Is it possible that a couple of trained assassins like us could be good parents? I don't know. Entry 3. I'm working a local mine, and Leah just got a job at the orphanage. We went there yesterday. I think up Da Vinci's journal. Entry 1. That's it. Done. Leah and I are retired. No more contracts. No more blades in the dark. And no more sneaking about. Leah says I'll soon grow tired of a normal life, but I'm not sure. I think I've seen all the death I care to. Now it's time to settle down and spend some of the gold we've saved. So meet the new us, just an honest couple doing honest work. Entry 2. We've just bought a house in Riverhold. Life is good here. It's peaceful enough and quite pretty in its own way. Most of the locals are pleasant and far more accepting than we were expecting. It's a very cosmopolitan place with all the border trading that goes on. 